Hello. Uh, can anybody hear me? Let's see if we have anybody showing up yet. Okay, so just uh, hanging out here, waiting for a few more people to show up. Uh, so far, it doesn't say we have any viewers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this thing started anyway. Um, yeah, hopefully people will show up. And yeah, maybe get a chance to watch it later, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, pulling up a slideshow. Hopefully this uh, is viewable by everyone. And I just want to introduce myself. My name is Snohomish Brown. I'm a licensed acupuncturist. I'm living in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I've been doing acupuncture for the last four years. But I've also been working in healthcare since uh, 2003. Um, started out as a massage therapist doing therapeutic massage in Redmond's, Washington. Um, since then, I've um, become an expert in soft tissue manual therapy. Uh, helping a lot of people with um, an integrative approach to medicine, incorporating both Chinese herbs, acupuncture now as well, uh, cupping, gua sha, and many other modalities, including moxibustion and electrostimulation. So um, I've been a nationally certified massage practitioner for many years, and also uh, volunteered with um, Santa Monica uh, Wise and Healthy Aging Senior Center, teaching Tai Chi and Qigong. And I've been an avid speaker on the benefits of Chinese medicine <clears throat> and hosted um, a lecture last year with Bill 2017. I hosted a number of lectures at my office near Beverly Hills. And um, I'm interested in treating all types of disorders, especially those that are most difficult to treat by modern medicine including immune disorders, thyroid problems, phlegm and edema issues, you know, weight loss, and also offers supportive therapy for cancer patients. We won a few awards, uh, Open Care Patients Choice winner last year, and uh, um, always committed to uh, helping people with their concerns of their health <clears throat> and also with aging. <clears throat> I've been a volunteer with a lot of uh, uh, music festivals in Southern California over the past couple of years, um, offering my services along with uh, other emergency healthcare providers, EMTs, nurses, and, and doctors. Um, I really enjoy that a lot and uh, also enjoy being here today. I want to thank uh, Bill2017 for hosting me. And uh, without further ado, let's talk about acupuncture and Chinese medicine solutions for rising costs in healthcare. So um, if, in case you didn't know, we're the number one in healthcare costs in the United States. Um, a lot of this, well, there's a few factors that, that ex explain this. Um, person for person, healthcare in the US costs about twice as much as it did for the rest of the developed world. In fact, if our, uh, in the United States, $3 trillion healthcare sector were its own country, it would be the world's fifth largest economy. If you have health insurance, you may think it, um, that you know because someone else is paying the bill, these costs don't really matter. 
um, but you'd be wrong. The, this country's exorbitant medical costs mean that we all pay too much for health insurance. And overpriced care also translates into fewer raises for American workers. If your employer, for instance, is uh, paying for your health care, um, you know, that's going to be a problem for you being able to get more of that money that he's paying into your paycheck. So <clears throat> think about it. And to top it all off, we're not even getting the best care for our money. Um, so I'll go into a few of these <clears throat> issues in more detail now. First, uh, be aware that even if you have insurance, it doesn't always fully protect you. There's lots of examples of this. Um, there's a woman named uh, Jocelyn Cravat. She's an occupational therapist from New York City who collapsed with a rare heart condition when she was in her mid-30s and ended up needed, needing to go to the emergency room for a heart transplant, okay? And she had it done at a hospital that was in her health plans network, but um, while she was being treated, no one bothered her. Um, there were a number of her uh, um, care in her network, and the transplant surgeons take her insurance. So they bill thousand dollars, and then some collection agents after while she was still home recuperating. And studying problems like these, um, you know, certain um, organizations like Consumer Report, it's a study here. We're looking at, um, you know, encourages folks to come forward with, with their. For, uh, you know, equal uh, tales with the uh, surprise out of network bills. And, um, you know, in addition to this, healthcare costs mean higher insurance premiums. Okay, so if the costs are higher, then the insurance premiums are going to be obviously higher for that too. And nowadays, a lot of uh, um, high deductible healthcare plans, which means that a lot of those costs are being poorer. You're a lot of people don't understand what the deductible means, but that's the amount that you're even a little bit. So um, sometimes uh, these costs might be kept down. So the copays are a lot more expensive. But the standard office visit bill would be. So you know, think about um, insurance. Insurance is about cooling risk. It's a good thing because it, it can protect you against on its like your end, but uh, companies have to collect then the higher the premium is for little or none of that. Here. <clears throat> Why you can't get ahead financially competing. Rate this already a little bit. Incomes have barely kept up with inflation since 2000. And the employer family health care plan uh, for most companies a few years ago was $38 per staff. In 2000, it shot up to $16,000. You know, some uh, uh, actually got that the year wrong. It, it shot up to to 60,000 in 2013. So, you know, that's, that's a big interest. and probably more now. So, your paycheck, but it didn't because your employer had to spend it on your health insurance instead. Much care for money either. And, it, you know, the fund of, of 2013 you know, of 11 developed countries' health care system. So uh, U.S. fifth in quality and worst for infant mortality. Okay, so we also did the worst job about the treatable conditions such as strokes, diabetes. These women, the Consumer Reports survey of over a thousand Americans, uh, we found considerable distress about high costs. Um, the twelve percent said that they had had some of their medical bills so this is where we talk about the high deductibles in the present that they had medical well, that they had trouble paying and the large majority said that they wanted better information about quality of their health care 
So, why exactly is there healthcare? So, a couple of examples already. But healthcare works nothing like other market transactions. You are a bystander to the real action which takes place between providers and hospitals, doctors, labs, and drug companies, even device manufacturers and private and governmental entities. That get so, a lot of these people are negotiating um, without any input from you about how much. So let's have, take a look at this next. Oh, there we go. Um, Healthcare costs are, are more than as um, hospitals are able to, to price whatever they want. Um, so back down. Um, there's no such thing as a legitimate price for anything in healthcare, says George Halverson, who's a permanent The giant, the Kaiser. He says that prices are depending on who the payer is. And when Medicare is paying the bills, private insurance companies and providers, on the other hand, and the prices often savagely. So, in regions with many computers, even play them against each other to hold down prices, but where there are only few providers, not so much bargaining power. Okay, And in your community, you might have noticed that a new outpatient in blazing with the name of a local hospital. Well, that's a hospital private medical practices to get more clout. Right? So that way they can charge more. Um, why? I get this to work. Right. So um, providers with the most clout are the brand name medical centers, which hold the special cash it for patients and are thus uh, must have hospitals for their insurers. In some markets, um, prestigious medical institutions can name their price. Um, they may have brand names of high prestige, but not necessarily deliver high quality care. Uh, there are small but hopeful signs that healthcare costs aren't getting quite as aren't growing quite as fast as they used to. <clears throat> medical costs are stabilizing, and it's uh, maybe too soon to tell though if it's a permanent trend. Trend though. So um, there's a few um, things that have caused certain outrages, um, and um, you know these are for a few reasons. Okay, so <clears throat> Americans usually will pay for their health care by the piece. You know, so much for each office visit, X-ray, outpatient procedure, etc. Um, that approach leads to one thing, though. There's a lot of waste and duplication. So up to 30% of the care provided in this country is unnecessary according to the Congressional Budget Office. If you have a treatment that requires three CT scans and you re-engineer the treatment so that it only requires one, it won't happen because the two CT scan uh, providers will lose a source of their revenue. And this um, you know, will, will mean that they won't re-engineer it to cut those people out. Okay, So this kind of piecework also rewards bad outcomes. It pays a lot more if you have a heart attack, but very little for preventing it. Okay, so preventive medicine is, isn't really um, something that uh, Western doctors will even, you know, for, um, bring up because you know it ends up cutting into their uh, their profits. Some insurance companies are making headway against overtreatment, which is why Consumer Reports has prepared a list of them in collaboration with the National Committee of Quality Assurance. This is a, a nonprofit um, that makes quality measurement and accreditation uh, organization um, that checks up on the or accreditations of uh, different organizations. So um, you can read up about them if you want. That's the NCQA. You can look that up. Um, here's a uh, another example of um, 
doctors charging what they want. Uh, a new bill for hepatitis C has hit the market that if taken by everyone, I'm sorry, a new pill um, for hepatitis C, um, if everyone takes it, uh, it would cost the Americans more per year than all other brand name drugs combined. So, you know, no one, not individuals, not private insurers, not Medicare can do anything about it. That's because here in the U.S., as long as this drug, Sovaldi, remains under patent, its owner, Gilead Sciences, can charge whatever it wants. At the moment, that's $1,000 per pill, or 84000 to 150000 for a single course of treatment. All right, Sovaldi costs, you know, have gone through the roof because of this uh, patent, which is one of the ways that... Um, doctors are incentivized to even make the medicine in the first place okay so this is something to think about um, there's other examples of drugs which um, you know for a year's treatment for a fatal illness you know that's the one thing that's keeping this person alive in other words uh, sometimes the course of treatment can be up to three hundred thousand so you know i heard this on npr the other day on national public radio here in the u.s and drug companies can always charge what the market will bear in the U.S. And in the U.S. market, it, it can bear a lot because there's such a huge discrepancy between, you know, people that have money and people that don't. And that this, that uh, gap is getting wider, experts say. So, you know, Mark Salo, who's the executive director of the National Association of Medicaid Directors, um, says, you know, that drug companies will charge what the market will bear, and in the United States, the market will bear a lot. He is a pol he's a, a head of the policy group based in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, he also goes on to share that hepatitis C affects 3.2 million um, aged, you know, bo mostly boomer-aged Americans who, who got it through either tainted blood transfusion or intravenous drug use. So uh, left untreated, it can lead to liver failure and is the leading re reason for liver transplants in the U.S. Um, you know, liver transplants are obviously going to be more expensive than taking a pill. So you can understand now um, why they're able to charge so much. All right. Um, liver failure is the leading re reason for liver transplants in the U.S. And um, older treatments were uncomfortable, took forever, came with uh, unpleasant side effects. And didn't always work. With Sovaldi, you can take the pill for a few months, and it has a cure rate of about 90% in clinical trials. So, if the uh, um, the folks giving the treatments can uh, balance the cost of a liver transplant versus the cost of a treatment of Sovaldi, then you can understand why they're able to charge so much because it's about market pressures. Okay, the industry defends the price on the grounds that it's cheaper than a $500,000 liver transplant. But most people with untreated hepatitis C never need a transplant. Even after 50 years, or 20 years, sorry, the, the savings from not having to treat the disease's worst effects would offset only about 75% of Savali's upfront costs. So meanwhile, it would add up to about $600 per person to the annual costs of a group health plan. So also another way for hospitals and medical practices to make gobs of money is to push a new trendy procedure, even if it's no better than an older one. Okay, and um, <clears throat> even one who really needs to be treated because, you know, many patients that have cancer, for instance, are so indolent that they you know, will probably die of something else long before the cancer kills them. So there's no incentive really to um, to, you know, to get rid of the cancer. Um, and so, you know, um, this happens in prostate cancer surgery um, where they'll just let it wait. You know, keep observing it until it becomes absolutely crucial that they do something about it. You know, people have to pee in a, in a catheter before they're going to even touch it. Um, you know, none of this has stopped medical marketers from persuading hospitals to spend over larger sums of money in so-called cutting-edge prostate cancer treatments, though, to lure patients away from competitors. So the poster child for this is the phenomenon of the robotic surgery, in which your local hospitals probably bragged about this, okay? So this was first introduced for prostate cancer surgery in 2001. The $2 million machine <clears throat> is a collection of laparoscopic instruments operated remotely 
It went from being used for 6% of prostate in 2004 to 83% in 2014, despite little evidence that it is better than other types of surgery, even though it comes with a higher price tag. So once your doctor gets this machine, he's probably likely to push it. Um, say, this is what you need to do. Um, it's the best, newest, latest uh, research, best technology. There's market value in a very expensive piece of technology, such as a robot, even if it doesn't work better. Says so, you know, Jeffrey C. Lerner, the president of the ECRI Institute. He runs a nonprofit health technology evaluation organization. And he says, nobody's ever going to put up a billboard about having the best bandage. <clears throat> and he's right. You know, everybody wants the new and flashy. So that's what the doctors push. And not to mention, you know, it also pockets their or pocketbook a little bit better. There's a more insurance, you know, here's a few ways that you can uh, rein in these expenses. You can find out the real cost of your treatment. Um, talk to your insurers. Uh, the, the, they can disclose to you at least some negotiated prices to uh, people in there among the membership who register with their websites. A feature. If your health plan is offering it, especially for things that you plan in advance, find out where you can do it the cheapest. In a recent experiment, um, people scheduled for CT scans or MRIs were called told about cheaper alternatives of equal quality, and they ended up saving participating insurers on average and prompted um, more expensive providers to cut their prices. So unless you go out there and search for these lower prices, they're going to continue to pay what they, what they can, what they believe the market will bear. Now, you know, you're cracked up and say otherwise. So also, if you want a celebrity doctor, be prepared to pay extra. Um, reference pricing is when an insurer analyzes its past claims to set a reasonable price for a good quality routine test or procedure and tells its customers that if they want to go to a higher cost in-network provider, they can, but you're going to be responsible for the difference they've set, and that's what they'll pay in the provider's price. And this happens a lot. You know, in it. Acupuncture, the reference price for uh, acupuncture that is being set by um, um, insurer warehouse uh, types of agencies like uh, American Spread, they will um, buy up a lot of contracts and, um, with the, the insurers and will cap the, the prices at a very low rate, meaning that. Um, if you want to get, you know, acupuncture care, you're often going to be paying for it at least some of where you go. CalPERS, which buys health insurance for 1.3 million California state employees and retirees, set a reference price of $30,000 for routine hip after discovering it was paying as much as 110000 for those procedures with other providers. In the first year, it's per patient, and several high cost Hospital suddenly discovered that they too could offer thirty thousand joint dollar, you know, joint replacements. So it can work the other way. You know, this fits up. Doesn't make sure that the quality stays high and consumers aren't caught in by surprise or caught in between. <clears throat> you know, consider that um, if they set the reference price at you know at a very high, then the people that are charging less will start to charge more. To meet the reference price and get what you know the bazooki they can get for that service. Also, um, you know this uh, can drive the price of, of certain uh, uh, prescriptions and treatments up as well as down. So, unfortunately, there's not a lot of regulation in, in the healthcare. And this might change uh, when uh, lawmakers decide to do that. You can also, here's another third way that you can uh, keep costs low, is to seek out smaller medical networks. You can uh, save about 20% on premiums by signing up with a plan that has fewer providers. Uh, providers then are able to give the insurer advice for competitors. But before signing on, make sure that the network includes the doctors and the hospitals and the labs and other services that you need within a You actually need to use your insurance. Also, make sure to go and become a patient of theirs before and we'll check up for something like that. 
actually be able to use their services when time comes more serious and urgent. Um, so you can also go to certain websites and see how hospitals compare quality and get a better idea of where you want to go. Um, so you know, we talked a little bit about I help them. What does this have to do with Chinese medicine and acupuncture? Because you know, as you can see, even acupuncture you know, deals with the same issues. And in the field of acupuncture, there's one models which offer um, services at different prices. So um, here's a, a, a chart that shows that what people were able to negotiate for private insurance uh, versus uh, Medicare. Um, Available recently uh, because the private insurers Aetna, um, Aetna is one of them. I forget what the other two. Uh, let me see. If I'm look that up. Yeah. Um, so anyway, these uh, private health insurers um, were able to uh, Aetna, United, and Humana made a database of health insurance claims data and made it available for research. Um, anonymizing all the, um, the claims that were made and um, you know it made this uh, data available to a nonprofit called Healthcare Cost Institute and obviously this was a, a uh, um, in the best interest of the health insurance or health insurers because they want to pay less for health care too all right so they want to um, you know, the differences in prices between private insurers and Medicare, which if we went to a single payer um, in America, which I think a lot of people would, would prefer, um, healthcare would look a lot more like Medicare. And the costs for healthcare would be more in the Medicare range, uh, which as you can see in this chart are, are the lowest costs. So um, now the problem with Medicare is that if you're on Medicare, you probably realize a lot of problems with Medicare. Um, is that the quality of the care goes down as well. So um, there needs to be a happy medium somewhere in the middle. Um, and this is what insurers generally find when they negotiate with healthcare providers. Um, so the yellow portion on the, each of these bars indicates what the negotiated price was after the insurers um, set those, um, um, those standard prices for, for each treatment and cost. And even though people, uh, you know, will uh, private uh, providers will um, charge whatever they want, you know, that's what the top of the each bar here shows is what the you know the charges were. Um, insurers will rarely pay that much, and will often pay more around the range of fifty percent. Um, once the reference price is set, though, um, then you know insurers and people who uh, providers that contract with those insurers. Um, will often only get paid and will, you know, even no matter what they request, the charge amount. However, by having that charge amount set so high, when people are stuck with out-of-network costs where insurance won't pay, then they often bear the brunt of having to pay that charge without having anyone to negotiate for them on their behalf. So um, in, some, in some cases, you can negotiate with your um, health care provider directly to get that cost lowered. But um, oftentimes, in order to do that, you have to show a financial need. Um, but I, that's that's also an option to try to bring your healthcare costs down. So um, it's a blurry photo of <laughs> of all your money being tied up by the, your doctors. Um, so let's talk about um, what you can do to prevent getting sick, because you know that's really the the crux of the matter. Is not about well, people have to you know figure out what they're when healthcare costs are so expensive, people have to figure out what they're actually going to invoke their insurance and, and go and, and file a claim <clears throat> um, to get healthcare. So you have to be a little bit more picky about what you're going to be sick about, and only go to the doctor if absolutely necessary. That's that's what happens. You know, when you end up having to pay more than you can afford for insurance and for your healthcare. So the um, this chart where we're looking at are some uh, some studies that have been done on um, epigenetics. If you don't know what epigenetics are, a lot of times um, people uh, will say that <clears throat> you know you, your genes are going to determine your health. 
Um, and uh, that's why a lot of people are interested in finding out, well, what, what do my genes say that I'm going to die from? And um, the truth of the matter is, is that there's a lot of evidence that shows that your environment has more uh, impact on your health outcomes than, than your genes do in the first place. Now, um, this evidence is, is coming out, um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done still, so there's a lot of skeptics about this and say, don't jump to so many conclusions right away. But why should we pay attention to this? And, and there's a few studies I want to show you. So this is a chart that shows um, different ways that you can have changes in uh, the protein sequence um, that are developed through RNA, um, which reads the DNA, and certain genes may be turned on or turned off based upon the environments and exposures you have to certain chemicals. Now, um, for instance, uh, methylation of DNA, that's something that's, uh, that certain chemicals um, will uh, create. Methylation is a process um, which you know, can turn on or turn off a gene that's in your uh, DNA. So the um, um, methylation process can, also, can uh, make it so that um, you age quicker or um, you know you might develop um, obesity or certain diseases where if you were not in an environment which caused that or, or you know caused less of that methylation then uh, you would not wind up with those diseases or, or those health outcomes so that's that's it in a nutshell what epigenetics uh, can can do um, genes environment and the generation game um, new research claims that environmental factors affect not just an individual's genes, but many of those of their offspring, too. So, you know, diabetes, obesity, uh, even certain phobias may all be influenced by the behavior of our forebears. As it turns out, <clears throat> we have two biological codes that are important in development, health and disease. Okay, the genetic code is the sequence of the DNA, which is the base pairs that tell how the cells how to build proteins. Um, proteins are the essential building blocks of life, and more than 99.9% .9 of the genetic code is identical among us. So we all kind of have the same, pretty much the same genetic code. Uh, and that 0.1% variation is important in the health traits such as height, weight, and eye color, and other variations that we see. Genetic variation is also important in individual susceptibility to various diseases across the lifespan including thousands of rare genetic diseases such as sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis uh, in which there are just single mutations which can have a drastic effect on health and disease. Now, uh, the epigenetic code, which is translated to mean something literally above the genome, does not affect the information contained in the DNA sequence but controls when and where this information is available to cells. The epigenetic code is determined by several mechanisms that affect gene expression, and the most well-known of which is DNA methylation. The epigenetic code can be altered by environmental exposures to such chemicals as, um, well, um, um, let's see, um, glyphosate. That's one that comes to mind. Um, this is uh, one of the, the chemicals found in a lot of. Um, um, you know, when we spray the plants to, uh, you know, kill bugs. Um, you know, this is one of the chemicals that is used to do that. So, um, especially in early life, the exposures of things like this can have a profound and long-lasting impact on gene expression across the whole generation. Uh, most of our knowledge about epigenetics comes from experimental studies. Um, epigenetic changes in cancer are the best characterized. Um, epigenetics can also be involved in certain birth defects, that can be affected by nutritional factors like folic acid deficiency um, in the diet. <clears throat> to illustrate the dramatic impact of epigenetics and the influence of modifiable environmental factors, um, there is a, a case of the agouti mouse. Um, so two mice with identical genetic codes, as with identical twins, are shown here. Um, in the yellow mouse, a region of the DNA is unmethylated, which makes the nearby a Gauti gene turned on all of the time, while in the brown mouse the region is methylated 
and the Gaudi gene is turned off. So the turning on of this gene leads not only to changes in coat color, but to predisposition of all kinds of metabolic diseases, including obesity and diabetes. Environmental exposures can influence whether or not this gene is turned on or off. For example, when pregnant mice are fed bisphenol A, or BPA, which is a chemical present in many commonly used products, water bottles especially, the number of offspring with the yellow obese coat color increases dramatically. Okay, this happens because BPA decreases DNA methylation so that more offspring have unmethylated agouti genes. Okay, thus BPA exposure is associated with a higher number of yellow mice predisposed to obesity and diabetes. Now, keep in mind that we share a lot of our genes with mice too. So that may also translate to humans. Um, when pregnant mice are exposed to BPA, along with the vitamin B cocktail, so here, this is interesting, you know, when B, co B cocktail means it has B12 and folic acid, um, B12 and folic acid both increase the methylation of the Gaudi gene, thus the offspring are no longer predominantly yellow and obese. Folic acid is important in growth and development and is recommended for women prevention of celiac birth defects. A lot of um, folic acid you know, in the past was uh, put into our bread and other grain products so that way you know it was kind of uh, able to um, address deficiencies but now a lot of people are going gluten-free so where are you getting your folic acid? This might be a good thing to look at if you're especially if you're pregnant. So uh, folic acid is also known to um, be uh, related to neural tooth de defects uh, such as spina bifida. So there's, there, that was one of the reasons why in the past folic acid was added to a lot of grain products was to um, get rid of that as, a, uh, as something that was happening you know, um, because of deficiencies in the diet. Um, all right, so in, besides the methylation of, of, um, of this particular um, part of the genome, there are many other regions of the genome that are susceptible to epigenetic regulation. Um, so there's strong suspicion that cumulative epigenetic, epigenetic changes due to environmental exposures to chemicals and stressors can help explain a lot of health disparities in the burden of various diseases among disadvantaged populations. We all know that um, the, the poorer uh, you are, the, the more likely you're going to be plagued by um, uh, problems such as health care um, and also development uh, such as education. So those two um, um, aspects of um, person's development suffer greatly in relation to social neighborhood specific epigenetic alterations potentially can be used to investigate the mechanisms underlying health disparities. You know, there's a lot of research that needs to be done in this area to really fully understand it. And so we have to kind of take each situation on one by one um, and, you know, apply rigorous epigenetic testing in order to actually get, make changes to be made in the way society does things. And that's really the only thing that's going to cause changes unless people take it on themselves to not wait for the government to make a change and make a change themselves. So this is, you know, going to be part of the solution to, um, you know, the healthcare costs is that people are going to have to take a more of a front seat driver kind of uh, approach to their own healthcare. So um, some of the other work that can be done in the epigenetics, are, you know, we need to assess the accuracy of measurements. Uh, so there needs to be standardized testing, um, and this is for the researchers really to to look at. Um, also assessing the relationship between epigenetic alterations to environmental exposures as well as health outcomes. We have to you know, validate the, the clinical uh, observations. And uh, number three, we have to evaluate the use of epigenetic biomarkers in environmental risk assessments and interventions. So this, this is where the rubber meets the road, how we, how we apply this. So as you can see in this example of the two mice, 
folic acid uh, being introduced into uh, the diet um, on a wide scale um, was one of the ways that we were able to get rid of spina bifida. See, with the BPA situation with these two mice, um, this is an issue that um, you know should be uh, addressed, and it might not be just through vitamin B and folic acid that we address it. We might need to uh, have these um, toxins taken out of our environment, uh, which would probably be the best solution. So um, the potential impact of epigenetic knowledge will be specific to each health outcome. <clears throat> and uh, effective prevention and treatment await a more complete understanding of the causes of human disease and the role that epigenetic modifications can play in improving the health of individuals and populations. Um, so one of the ways that um, Chinese medicine can help is to look, you know, you can compare Western medicine to Chinese medicine and say that Western medicine is looking at you know, the trees individually, and the Chinese medicine could look more for us so we can have a more comprehensive view of health. When we blend Chinese and um, Western medicine together, um, this is what we 